You are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where industry leaders, regulators, and lovers of cannabis gather collectively to move policy forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. Professionals and cannabis curious alike can tune in to hear leading cannabis experts share and discuss headlines, critical industry issues, social topics, and more. The State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. Hi, and welcome to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where we bring you all the top stories you need to know and talk about them for four minutes and 20 seconds. Our news is bite-sized and infused with a nice mix of facts, opinions, and a pinch of humor. It's Wednesday, January 26, 2022. This is episode number 202. I'm Susan Soares, the founder of the State of Cannabis News Hour and Conference, author of the children's book, What's Growing in Grandma's Garden, and Cannabis' Favorite Grandma, a.k.a. Nanogram. If you're listening to the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, the show is live every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on Clubhouse. Join us and over 24,000 State of Cannabis News Hour members if you want to be an audience participant. Otherwise, please subscribe and support our show. Today we're talking about a bill to limit THC and pot. Oklahoma wants to put the brakes on licensing. Flow Kana is now Whoa Kana. A fresh a French kiss for CBD flowers. Sonoma County steps up for cannabis farms with tax relief and many other frosty nuggets. So stay tuned for the full 60 minutes of the State of Cannabis News Hour. The following program contains coarse language and nudity. Viewer discretion is advised. Audience, feel free to raise your hands if you want to weigh in on a headline after it's been read, and we'll try to bring you up to the stage. Keep it brief and relevant, or you might get the gong. Before we start today's show, I want to wish our correspondents Gretchen Gailey and Christopher Smith a happy belated birthday. We love the work that you do on the show. I also want to wish Sugar a happy birthday today. Yeah, sugar. Happy birthday. We love you. I love you all too. Thank you so much. Kicking off the show today is Nicole West. She is a cannabis business specialist, part-time firefighter and cat herder, and director of operations at LB Atlantis. A veteran in the cannabis industry and always ready to use her experience to guide others. The show wouldn't be what it is today without her expert leadership. What is your headline today, Nicole? Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Susan. Um, My headline today actually is a twofer, and I just wanted to reference both of them because I'm talking about Oklahoma uh, on two different levels. Today at Oklahoma yesterday, GOP lawmakers filed a bill to decriminalize psilocybin. At the same time, other lawmakers introduced bill to pause medical cannabis business licensing. Super interested to see how this unfolds. So an Oklahoma lawmaker has introduced a bill that would allow regulators to pause the medical cannabis business licensing, according to the Tulsa World Report. Republican Rusty Cornwell has filed House Bill 3208 to give the Oklahoma Medical Marijuana Authority, or OMMA, the power to implement a moratorium on licenses as the agency deems necessary. Since 2018, Oklahoma has had seen a huge number of commercial medical marijuana grows and facilities flooding into our communities. Cornwell told Tulsa World that the initial rush of rollout to the system for granting commercial licenses, we failed to enforce their compliance with state law. House Bill 3208 would temporarily pause the issuance of commercial licenses so that we can confirm the current operations are complying within the law. The legislation would also prohibit the transfer of cannabis business licenses or sale of facilities if the existing license or facility has current violations, according to this news outlet. At the exact same time, there was a Republican, Daniel Pay and Logan Phillips from Oklahoma, that filed bills meant to promote research into the therapeutic potential use of psilocybin. The proposals are designed to give legislature different options with similar study objectives, but the key difference between Pay's would allow to decriminalize possession of up to one and a half ounces of psilocybin, which is a little bit... uh, 
crazy to say because they're actually meaning mushrooms, not exactly psilocybin because one and a half ounces of psilocybin is a lot of fucking psilocybin. Uh, but making it punishable by a fine if you have more than that reported marijuana moment. Uh, I'm super interested to see how this actually all shakes out because, I mean, there's two psilocybin bills on and there's one to limit medical cannabis. I genuinely understand the medical cannabis conversation uh, as far as their licensing is concerned. There was a flood of cultivations and manufacturing out in Oklahoma over the past few years and just not a market to sustain it. That would even make sense. So I definitely understand this being something that somebody would reference or would try to bring up, but I'm curious to see how it all shakes out. And I'm interested to see what the, uh, what our panels, as well as anybody from Oklahoma has to say, do you think they're going to put this ban and put this moratorium on? And if so, um, do you think that there's going to be a bit of a, of a revolt? Cause there's a lot of people still planning on getting licenses right now. And I'm Nicole West reporting for the state of cannabis news. I think they should totally should put in, uh, put in this, put in this, uh, moratorium or stay on issuing new licenses in Oklahoma. And basically if you already don't have a license in Oklahoma and are planning on it, you should focus on another state cause you missed the boat. That's when you hop on a private jet. Which is great for flying over Oklahoma. Yeah, don't stop in Oklahoma in your PJ for show. <laughs> Nobody in the audience from Oklahoma? Where's our Oklahomans at? Oklahoma. Oklahomies. Yeah, Oklahomies. Oklahomies. And, and Nicole, I'm really excited to hear you sing the praises of the GOP in Oklahoma. They, you know, I thought... I thought you would enjoy that. I was actually super interested. I'm like, damn, the, the fucking Republican Party coming through. Uh, maybe I'm going to have to start hanging out with Gretchen and Jason more. I don't know. The GOP is definitely the fun guy in the room in Oklahoma. They are a grand old party. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> All right, fine. There's going to be mushrooms. There might not be weed. Enjoy it, Oklahoma. Come to California when you all get bored. In all fairness, no one wants that boof that's grown in Oklahoma. That's anyway. what I was going to ask. Are the mushrooms going to be boof too? Is there is that a thing? Boof rooms. <laughs> mushrooms is a thing, actually. Yeah, totally. There's a there's for sure a boof mushroom market right now. Unfortunately, I know I've seen some really pretty ones uh, and some pretty ugly ones. Does that have any? How do you tell what what a good mushroom looks like? Psilocybin. If they're penis envy, they're good. Shiitake psilocybin content um or psilocin um uh content i mean at the end of the day they could be beautiful and still not be the magic mushrooms that you were looking for you know if you're just not a lot of people don't even fucking like to eat mushrooms but will eat magic mushrooms because they think that there's psilocybin in them so you know booth mushrooms would be psilocybin list mushrooms so wouldn't we what rico wouldn't we just call those shiitake mushrooms mm, shit takis what was the difference between the uh, the red and the green mushrooms that uh, Super Mario and Luigi had? The superpowers that you'd get from eating them. Yeah, like were they like from different regions, like, on different kind of cow patties or what? Uh, Brandon, since we're talking about Super Mario, can I play the sound effect or is that going to? I think comp- we're, no, that's for sure. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak for Brandon <laughs> on this one. <laughs> Mario sound effect. No, I'm told, yeah, play it, play the, play the Mario. You want to get us shut down, Jason? We're gonna get fucking taken off of YouTube. Don't do this to us. Play okay. the Mario. We're gonna keep stop censorship. Don't do it. Brandon says, "Don't do you it in do the, the back noise. channel." You, why don't you do the noise? I thought this is America. Do, 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 do. Thank you. <laughs> I'm clip. I'm clipping that shit. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. We're going to keep moving because we've got a lot of stories to cover today. Uh, up next is Rico Lamite. He likes to ask the tough questions that the mainstream mainstream media refuses to ask. The self-proclaimed dopest dad alive is here to encourage other dope dads that incorporate cannabis to enhance their parenting. Find him on TEDx or one of his Cannavision events, but always find him here every weekday as co-producer of the State of Cannabis. This news hour. What you got today, Rico? All right, so my story is coming out of the New York Times. Cannabis events come out of hiding in New York City. So as um, New Yorkers wait for marijuana sales to be legalized, some small businesses are putting down their roots. So on paper, New York legalized last year in 2021, uh, but adult use sales and official consumption lounge guidelines remain in the air. Licenses and permits are expected to be issued later this year and regulated businesses up and running by 2023. However, 
A few bowl players have stepped up hosting events across the Empire State to educate and entertain consumers while Governor Hochul um, irons out the details. Luckily, over the years, I've managed to make a few industry friends in high places and outside of here in California and outside of California. And I couldn't be more proud uh, that these friends just happen to be um, a couple of those bold people I'm talking about. Late 2021, my partner Ryan Zizinski and I successfully launched our Maison Type premium hemp street clothing line in New York City's Flatiron District at the Stone Age NYC, an immersive and interactive 10,000 square foot art exhibit, um, taking patrons on a journey through culture and cannabis uh, with the help of my good friend, New York native Sasha Perelman, who I've known for at least five years now. But per today's New York Times article last summer, another one of my big New York connects, Happy Monkey, tested the waters of consumption events with the immersive Van Gogh exhibit at Pier 36, a 75,000 square foot waterfront space on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Happy Monkey's co-founders Ramon Reyes and Vladimir Batista have deep Dominican roots, but both grew up in NYC, uh, Washington Heights to be exact. They launched their own brand back in 2017 while hosting underground events. I met their COO, David Hernandez, in 2019 through a prior event series I was involved in, and it's been by coastal love and respect ever since. Unfortunately, I'd used up my dope dad travel budget for the quarter, so I couldn't be there in person, but I did cover mind-blowing Van Gogh experience extensively here on State of Cannabis News Hour as well as on Cannavision. So I'm very proud, Happy Monkey PR and international man of and for the culture, Stu Zakum, is joining us today. Stu, great to have you back out here with us, brother. You on? I am, Rico. Thanks for having me. Uh, much love to you, man. Uh, could you kindly give us a little bit of color on uh, how y'all were able to flip the NYC cannabis event game on its head with the Van Gogh experience and uh, what we can expect going forward for both Happy Monkey and New York's event industry while the Bob's Upstate figure out what is what? Sure, I'm happy to tell you. So following a pretty successful 420 event in, in Wall Street, which the Monkey ran and was really New York's first legal pop party, so we... Uh, it's all about changing the conversation and the perception of how people see cannabis consumers. So the media was out in force for that one. And that kind of attention drew the people from the Van Gogh exhibit upon someone suggesting to them, how cool would it be if we went through this high that uh, they need to partner with someone like the monkey. The meeting happened. Uh, we had 10 days. And in 10 days, we put on two nights with over 1,100 guests on both nights. Uh, it really was a ceiling, glass ceiling breaker. And more importantly, Rico, the story in the Times is like a dream come true for all of us, not just the monkey, but in mainstreaming the conversation about cannabis in the paper of record. Um, I, I honestly can't ask for more than that as a career PR person. It's pretty. It's pretty fucking big, man. Um, what do you think is uh, What do you think is going to happen in the in, in the event and consumption uh, industry going forward as you guys wait for um for Ho, Ho, How do you pronounce her name? Is it Hokil? Hokel. Hokel. Uh, as you wait for uh, Hokel to um, uh, put out the actual guidelines. Well, you know, New York is probably the only state that allows you to smoke weed anywhere that they smoke tobacco. So as long as we do outdoor events. Uh, not just us, but the, the New York City cannabis community, like the marijuana, you know, the annual marijuana parade uh, on Saturday, May 7th, um, which is the longest running event in the country uh, about cannabis. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's really hard to, to answer your question, to be honest with you, um, because everyone is planning stuff now. 420 clearly, as the New York Times references, the Happy Monkey is going to have a major event with performers and education components. There'll be other uh, similar events going on throughout the city because we all want to celebrate this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, details to come on with the Monkey event will be, but uh, trust me, it will certainly be classic. Well, I'll, be, I'll be looking forward to that, and hopefully I'll be out there in the Big Apple as well. This has been Rico Lamite, dopest dad here on the street, uh, representing State of Cannabis News Hour. And back to you, Susan and Nicole. I've decided that I want to pronounce her name Ho Chu. You can say that, but I can't. What about Hachu? <laughs> <laughs> Ho Chu. All right. Well, up next, we have an international man of mystery, the very own cannabis is. Kaiser Brose, the longest-running retail uh, retailer of cannabis in history. What do you have for us today, Jason? Oh, good morning, Nicole. 
Uh, today, uh, my, my headline is, is more about Macy Grace. And I want to, I, I, I extracted a bunch of quotes from a bunch of different articles um, to to kind of paint the picture and, and tell the story of who Macy Grace is since she's leading the charge for our, for our industry on Capitol Hill. The freshman representative from South Carolina introduced an Americans for Prosperity endorsed bill to end federal pop prohibition and says legalization is an issue that unites America, just like apple pie. There, there's a million reasons to end federal prohibition, and the only place where it is controversial is up here, says Mace. It's an enormously popular idea. America is like WTF, DC, basically. What the fuck, DC? Why haven't you done this yet? Amazon, the company, met with Mace and now says it will support the State's Reform Act. They don't want to sell it, Mace says. Nothing that em- that nothing that employment is driving is the driving force behind the support. It opened up open ups the hiring pool by about ten percent. Brian Hausman, Amer- uh, Amazon's vice president of public policy, adds this bill offers comprehensive reform that speaks to the emergence of bipartisan consensus to end federal prohibition of cannabis. Meanwhile, Koch's political advocacy group, Americans for Prosperity, is fully behind Mace's new bill. AFP will spend millions to lobby to make this the most highly resourced effort in the history of this issue, says the group's chief government affairs officer, Brent Gardner, to achieve Mace's vision of legalization and federal prohibition, institute a a, a low federal excise tax, regulate cannabis in a similar fashion to alcohol, and allow states to create their own laws. The cannabis industry also adores Mace and her bill. Mace clearly knows how to how to please and provoke people on both sides of the aisle. In many ways, she's your typical Republican. She loves guns, low taxes, and free trade, but hates Dr. Fauci and warns that socialists want to take over America, which is honestly pretty true. Similar, similarly, she called on Republicans to rebuild our party after the January 6th insurrection and opposed efforts to overturn President Biden's win, but she also voted to remove Representative Liz Cheney from the GOP leadership and voted against forming a bipartisan commission to investigate the Capitol Hill riot. As she is known for her skirmishes with Republicans like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Democrats like AOC, Alicia Ocasio-Cortez, whom she refers to as, I love this part, performance artists, not politicians. In November, after Mace criticized Lowen Boebert, a Republican representative from Colorado, uh, for calling Representative Ilhan Omar, a Democrat from Minnesota who is Muslim, a terrorist, Green tweeted that Mace is trash of the GOP conference. Mace returned fire, tweeting a series of emojis, a bat, a turd, and a clown to call basically her green bat shit crazy. Uh, they, they want to have twi- – the, in quote, she says, they want to have twiddle, Twitter followers. May says – sitting on her office beside a pile of books, including her own, in the company of men, a woman at the Citadel, and The Lords of Discipline, a novel set at the school by South Carolina's most celebrated author, Pat Crony. They want to say the craziest thing to get in the TV interviews and then raise a bunch of money, but then they do nothing with it. Then again, Nancy Mace has been well, well, well trained for conflict, born at Fort Bragg, to an army major and, and a school teacher, she became the first woman to graduate from the Citadel's Corps of, Can- of Cadets in 1999 after earning a master's degree in journalism and communications. She started her own PR and marketing firm and then pivoted into politics. M- Mace's path to pot was defined by her resilience in 1994 when Mace was a 16-year-old high school student. She was raped by a classmate. She dropped out of high school on her 17th birthday and started working at a local Waffle House. She was put on prescription medication to deal with her depression and anxiety, but it didn't help. In a quote, it made me want to end it all, she says. Then she started smoking cannabis for about a year to help curb her anxiety. It helped me get through some really difficult times, says Mace, who quickly adds that no one should self-medicate nor use medical marijuana without a prescription. Mace's bill is also being touted as a lifeline to farmers who grow cannabis. Randall Meyer, a lobbyist for um, a lobbyist and member of the Cannabis Freedom Alliance, is also the executive uh, director for GACC, a group that that includes AFP, says the bill's stance on free trade allowing companies to import and export marijuana would be a boon for U.S. growers. American cannabis is the most valuable cannabis in the world, says Meyer, and we're essentially sitting on a cash crop that 
that we don't export to people who are willing to pay four or five times what American consumers would pay for the same quantity. And finally, in my last quote, Republicans are the ones leading, and this is in regards to South Carolina with their medical bill, Republicans are the ones leading on these issues, May said in an interview. This is not just a Democrats issue, and in our bright red conservative state, it's conservatives that are leading the revolt. That's a good thing for South Carolina, and kudos, uh, Congressman Mace. We support you and stand with you, and this is Jason Beck reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. My mute wasn't off. That was a, that was a, that was a real, that was a real nice Republican um, uh, brochure, <laughs> digital brochure <laughs> that you put out there. Nice, nice little commercial there. Thank you very much, South Carolina Republicans. Yes, indeed. So I just want to be like, I want to just say, Petey Pablo with South Carolina. No, it was North Carolina, and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure um, um, respectable rap artists are staying away from uh, the Republican end of uh, South Carolina as well. So keeping it on the Republican train here. <laughs> She's a feisty redheaded conservative with Mayflower roots and an avid supporter of safe banking. She never backs down from a debate with cannabis lovers across the aisle. Now that Sarah Fox isn't on with us, she completely owns that female Republican point of view here at NewsHour. Up next is Gretchen Gailey. What you got for us this morning, Gretchen? Good afternoon, Rico. Well, I am keeping it in the South uh, with Republicans. Uh, Marijuana Moments headline today is Mississippi lawmakers reach deal to send medical marijuana bill to governor this week. Mississippi House and Senate lawmakers have reached an agreement to send a bill to legalize medical marijuana to the governor's desk this week. Following Senate action yesterday, the bill will now go on to a bicameral conference committee to finalize details on the legislation, with votes in both chambers for final passage expected today. Senator Kevin Blackwell and Representative Lee Yancey uh, discussed the agreement at a press conference yesterday. There was an opportunity for a concurrence vote in the Senate where the bill originated and advanced to the House this month and was then amended. But following pushback from the Mississippi Municipal League over a House change related to zoning rules for cannabis businesses, the Senate voted against concurrence and will instead move the measure to conference. This comes more than 14 months after voters in Mississippi passed an initiative to legalize medical cannabis, a law that state Supreme Court later overturned and the bill that's being tweaked again is the result of months of negotiations and last-minute changes to a nearly 450-page bill. This has been a long journey, and it's nice to be in a place where everyone is in agreement, said Yancey. It looks like we will finally be able to provide relief to those people with debilitating illnesses who so badly need it. Medical cannabis will now be an option for them as soon as we get the conference report signed and sent to the governor. While the overall bill will remain largely the same as an earlier version passed by the Senate this month, the recent House amendments reduced the overall monthly amount of cannabis products, removed the Department of Agriculture or Commerce from oversight of the industry, and expanded zoning allowances for cannabis cultivators and processors. Only the zoning allowances provision will change. Instead of allowing cultivators and processors to operate in commercial zoning areas, as would have been allowed under the bill as amended by the House, they would only be permitted in industrial or agricultural zoned areas satisfying the MML. Assuming that the conference goes as planned, the legislature will then formally transmit the bill to Governor Tate Reeves, who then has five days, excluding Sundays, either to sign it into law or return it with objections. Both the Senate and House, however, have passed the legislation with veto-proof majorities. If the governor doesn't take any action by the deadline, the bill will become law without his signature. Reeves has been wary of legalization in recent months, at one point threatening to veto a draft bill if it made it to his desk. Since then, proponents in the legislature have worked to balance the voter-approved initiative, more permissive proposals against the governor's call for tighter restrictions. The governor said last week that the measure has become better with every revision and rightly predicted further amendments by the House. Provided the bill becomes law, dispensaries would be licensed about six months later, meaning Mississippi's medical cannabis program could be up and running, at least in limited form, by the end of the year. Uh, I'm so torn on this because obviously we want to see cannabis expanding, but it seems like they're going to be getting a very raw deal in Mississippi, especially with uh, the limits that they have allowed. Uh, We shall see if uh, Reeves decides to put up a fight. I really don't think he will. Uh, since uh, both the House and the Senate are veto-proof at this point. Uh, this is Gretchen for State of Cannabis News Hour. I feel like we should 
like start asking for the Southern Tourism Board to sponsor our show this for today because this has been like a Republican Southern like hoorah so far. I hope we get some spiciness towards That's the end. That's where all the good stuff's happening, Nicole. Down south with Republicans. Yeah, no spice though. <laughs> Red pill. Everybody. It's like Nilla wafer. It's like, like Nilla wafers everywhere. Just like just boiled meat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we need some chili for that cornbread hemp. Hey, I'm really excited for, for for Mississippi. They're the poorest state in the union, and cannabis is really going to help them out um, with their, with their economic statuses and jobs out there. So kudos. I just hope it right it helps the right people down there. Well, it's only right people down there, so it will help everyone. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what, one concern That's that left. I have before we jump away is that they've changed the zoning laws, um, and so they can only be now in industrial areas or agricultural areas. I think that's going to limit, you know. Uh, accessibility to patients, and I think that's a piss poor move. I mean, but how, how, how many urban areas are really down there, anyways? Isn't it all just not very urban? Yeah. Agricultural and um, <laughs> shipyard I, and shit. I get it, but if you're you know taking the bus to go places, they don't normally go to the agricultural areas. I don't know. We'll see. I, I think it's going to be difficult. Swamps and plantations. Mm. They just need California bud. That's what they will have it soon. They will have it soon. Open up interstate trade. I'm sure they got some yes. good Mississippi Delta Eight. <laughs> All right. Well, we will go ahead and hop to Yikes. our next story: the birthday girl, D Sugar Coplin Easley, industry chef, consultant, and advocate, and the co-chairman of Los Angeles Re- Re- Regional Reentry Partnership Education Committee. What do you have for us today, D? <laughs> Good morning. Good day, everyone. Happy Wellness and Birthday Wednesday. My story is from Rolling Stone, written by Julian Cohen, and it is Making Cannabis More Accessible, Lessons Learned from the Alcohol Industry. We are at a moment in American history where cannabis is thoroughly mainstream, despite still being federally legal, not just a cultural mainstay for music and movies. Today, we see cannabis-based products punctuate the shelves of wellness shops, grocery stores, and makeup counters. Chefs and celebrities, including myself, host cannabis-infused dinners for their famous friends. Even Martha Stewart, a domestic goddess known for prim and proper living, is a vocal cannabis connoisseur who has her own award-winning line of CBD products. Not surprisingly, there are compelling parallels between the rise of modern cannabis consumption and how alcoholic beverages have reemerged and grown since the Prohibition years. Alcohol usage today is widely embraced and incorporated into many walks of life. In fact, according to recent federal health statistics, the average American now consumes nearly 500 drinks per year or about nine per week per person. And I'm going to say that those statistics are definitely from the pandemic. I know I've had a few more than usual as well. The reasons for alcohol's move to mainstream are vast and complex. However, when viewed as a proxy of cannabis normalization, there are three key focus areas that cannabis industry should be aware of that helped propel the alcohol industry into the global juggernaut that it is today, governing, offering greater format uh, variety, encouraging more diversity usage occasions, and setting consumer expectations for a responsible experience. Consider the range of spirits offerings from cheap blended spirits to high-end liquors, from flavorless vodkas and flavorful gins, from unaged rounds and decades-aged whiskeys. Now, cons- nowadays, consumers have access to numerous categories of spirits in multiple groups and at a wide variety of price points. Format differentiation is also central to the growth of the cannabis industry. With the numerous ways cannabis can address people's wants and needs, increasing the breakneck pace, the culture of cannabis prohibition kept a tight lid on inventive options and in many ways closed off cannabis to those potentially interested. But that is rapidly changing. While alcohol can position itself on different occasions, it's still limited, primarily social and predominantly at night. It's solo or day drinking aren't generally socially accepted. However, cannabis extends far beyond the realm of the buzz and recreational consumption. It includes healing and many others. Cannabis impacts people in different ways. It's a social and it is on the individual level. Similar to how alcohol drinking norms evolved in 
uh, participants creating contemporary ways to use the product, the lifestyle and culture of cannabis are rapidly evolving. More than just smoking to get high or to manage an ongoing medical issue, there is an incredible opportunity for consumers to leverage cannabis products in unique ways, such as to tailor their mood. Ushering in new audiences to experience cannabis centers around entry point education and the reliability of cannabis products. There is a need to create consistency, predictability, and control with dosing standards. As we near the potential for federal cannabis legalization, it is paramount that the future of cannabis is not just seen through the lens of the traditional or legacy consumer, but reimagined through the lens of those seeking to simply live their lives and improve their daily experiences. There is a place for everyone and anyone in our increasingly inclusive cannabis culture. This is D. Sugar Copeland Easley with a huge request before I end this story. It is my birthday, and normally on birthdays, people say, hey, I'd love for you to donate to someone that I love. I love you, Susan. And I ask that all of our audience members and those who are listening and just a earshot away from us, please donate to the State of Cannabis News Hour. Please go to the to the stateofcannabis.org and give your donation today. I love you, Susan, and I love all you correspondents. Aww. This is Sugar reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Aww. You're the best. Love you too. We are, thank you so much and happy birthday again. We're going to quickly relight this room. You are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. The thoughts and opinions expressed in the State of Cannabis News Hour are those of the individual speakers, not those of any other speaker, the State of Cannabis, or its members. The statements made in the State of Cannabis News Hour do not constitute legal or accounting advice, and the State of Cannabis and its speakers make no representation regarding the legal status of any substance in any country, area, or territory, or any other authorities. The views expressed in this room do not establish any fiduciary relationships. The sponsorship of the State of Cannabis News Hour do not imply or constitute any endorsement by the State of Cannabis or the expressions of any of the opinions whatsoever on the part of the State of Cannabis or any of its speakers. Viewer discretion advised. Let's keep smoking the news. Let's. Now, she's a pot-loving PhD pushing for common-sense cannabis policy for everyday people and an outside-the-box activist who remains optimistic in the midst of cannabis chaos. Up next, we got Manika Mahajan. What you got for us this morning, Manika? Thank you so much, Rico, and happy Weed Wednesday to everyone. I have some good news today. My story comes from the Press Democrat and is reprinted in the North Bay Business Journal. I'm talking about temporary tax relief in Sonoma County. Yesterday, January 25th, the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors voted unanimously, without discussion, to delay the due date for first quarter local cultivation taxes from January 31st, which is next Monday, until April 30th. Growers will have another three months. Taxes for both quarters will be due without penalties or interest on April 30th, possibly later if the board approves another extension. Local growers and industry advocates have spent months pushing for tax relief, and the recent state-level cultivation tax hike added to the urgency of their campaign. Here's how Sonoma County grown weed is taxed. Sonoma County taxes local growers at different rates on a per-square-foot basis for outdoor, indoor, and mixed-like crops. Tax rates range from $1.12 per square foot for the smallest outdoor license type, up to $12.65 per square foot for the small and medium indoor license types. Cities in the county can also add their own taxes. On top of that, the state taxes growers by the ounce, and excise taxes are charged at point of sale. About 170 licensed cannabis cultivators, five dispensaries, and five manufacturers pay taxes to the county, and the median annual tax revenue collected by the county in recent years from cannabis operators is $2.5 million dollars. When the board had met on January 1st, or January 4th, excuse me, earlier this year to discuss the issues, multiple farmers and advocates had said that growers were unable to keep up with the high costs and were either selling to corporate operators or dropping into the traditional market. Thankfully, the board took action yesterday and is, is scheduled to discuss potential long-term relief options on March 15th. We've covered the challenges of paying the state's cultivation tax many times, and it's hard to imagine how farmers are holding on with an additional local cultivation tax at those rates that I mentioned earlier. I hope that deeper reforms are made come March. If anyone from Sonoma County, either a farmer or representative of the Growers Alliance or other local organization, is in the audience, please raise your hand. I'd love to hear from you. 
Um, I'm curious how many of the how much of the local industry is on the brink of selling off their farms or leaving the licensed market because that would be tragic, of course. And then will local farmers be able to come up with two quarters of taxes by April 30th? This is Menika Mahajan reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Back to you, Rico. You know, Menika, when you were mentioning that it's uh, the taxation is by the square foot, yeah. is what what happens? At, I mean, I just started thinking vertical growing. <laughs> Let's just grow straight up. They, um, they, they count square footage of canopy, so you would still be getting stacked on every one of those. It, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. But outdoor too, tall, skinny plants with light on the sides. I don't know. Enter Jason Beck with Outdoor Jokes. It's a lot of taxes. Keep the booth out of the weed. I mean, realistically, we really need to have a serious conversation with the state in regards to the way that we're taxing cultivators at a state level. The fact that we're taxing it based on weight rather than sales amount is fucking insane. Like, I definitely understand the square footage part being frustrating as well. But the fact that we're charging the same amount for a pound being sold for $200 as a pound being sold for $2,000 is nuts. Cannabis is the only agricultural commodity that has a cultivation tax. It's grossly ridiculous that we should have a cultivation tax, and it needs to be removed as soon as possible. Facts. All Not right, to mention, well, too, the Democrats came up with a cultivation tax. <laughs> <laughs> For that story, Minica, and your fucking peanut gallery, Jason. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and jump to our next correspondent. We have Christopher Smith as our next correspondent. He is a communication strategist and the publisher of the American Cannabis Report. And our very own Clark Kent. What do you have for us today, Superman? Good morning, Nicole, and good morning, Rico. Hi, Susan. Uh, my story today is from uh, the UK cannabis publication Leafy. Uh, France lifts ban on sale of CBD flour. So as my friend uh, Priscilla Agoncilla reported back in early July, France's highest court ruled at that time in that CBD, including CBD flour, are legal in the country. And in that ruling, the, the court to cassation uh, went on to say that hemp or CBD must originate from another EU country and that CBD is not a narcotic. Patrice Spinozzi, a lawyer at the court of cassation, uh, with previous experience in CBD cases, told Newsweed at the time, this judgment is important because it definitely retrains, retains in our law that from the moment a CBD product has been legally produced in another state of the European Union, then it cannot be subject to a qualification of narcotics. And no prosecutor would dare go against this decision. That was July. Passi vite, Madame Spinozzi, that's not too fast, or not so fast there in high school French, because on the 31st of December 2021, French authorities presented the nation's CBD vendors with a very unwanted gift, the banning of the sale of CBD flour and leaves in all forms. So it seems that cannabis and hemp prohibitionists are an international conspiracy. And who gets hurt in the French scenario? Just like the U.S., the Le Petit Shops, of course, all 1,800 of them. Them. One of the main arguments put forward by the industry when the ban was announced was that CBD flour sales represented the majority of sales in these specialist shops. Well, the industry fought back immediately with the Union des Professionnels du CBD uh, filing an injunction in the courts on January 1st against the new ruling, working through the night of New Year's Eve to do so. Their argument was that the EU classified CBD as a non-narcotic and, at, and France as a member state of the the EU, CBD should be treated no differently in their country. They argued that cannabis sativa L, whose THC content is less than 0.3%, would not present a degree of harmfulness to the to health justifying a local and absolute prohibition measure. This threshold is precisely that retained by the contested decree itself to characterize the cannabis plants authorized for cultivation, etc. And on Friday, the 14th of January, victory. The French Supreme Court ruled in favor of the CBD industry by temporarily suspending the ban while the Conseil des d'État, which I think it must be like our attorney general, investigated further. The French CBD industry celebrated the suspension of the ban with a quote, this result is great news for all businesses that have faced having their livelihoods taken from them by government actions. But in no way is this the end of the road, says Benjamin Alexandre Jean Ra 
of Paris-based consultancy Augur Associates. We will have to see how things unfold. I believe the government will look for another baseless argument. As long as the government wishes to show that it's tough on drugs, whatever that means, we can throw out any rational data or even legal argument. It won't make them change their position, and certainly not during an election campaign. So good luck over in France, and hopefully they can get things sorted out and keep the CBD business flowing. I just got to say, Christopher, I love your French accent. That was fantastic. I was, a, I was a solid B student, no doubt. This was a great story, Christopher. Thanks for bringing it. I'm curious if this will be precedent setting and if this will uh, encourage the United States to move forward with exports and just cannabis banking for not only cannabis, but also CBD. It's definitely not going to encourage the U.S. in any way, but what would be really great is if it did encourage Germany to kind of get on the same page as well. Well, and also the UK, which has had such such problem getting anything legal. A hundred percent. But, you know, Germany pretty much controls the EU. And once Germany goes, so does the rest of it. I think we should celebrate all steps forward. And so, yay, precedent setting. CBD in the Ukraine. Oh, man. All of the things in the Ukraine. Maybe they truly, sorry, but maybe they really need it over there. It's pretty stressful. I think some CBD would help everybody relax a little bit. No no more U.S. troops in Ukraine. How about that? How about that? We could send Tucker Carlson to the Ukraine. How about no more politicians uh, uh, um, participating with China? Participating Uh-oh. with them? Uh-oh. Huh? What? Uh-oh. <laughs> let's let's keep moving. Keep it in moving. Keep we're going, it moving. We're going down the wrong direction. Here. Good Back lord. Road, where's where's the editor? The where's the editor? <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> he's known and respected as an outspoken defender of the culture and perpetual bridger of gaps. And our next correspondent can teach us all a thing or two about going from legacy to legal without losing your soul in the process. He's a co-founder and president of Pop and Barkley, and hands down one of my favorite OGs in the game. Up next is Guy Rocourt. What you got for us today, my brother? Good morning, Rico. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Susan. Good morning, Nicole. Team. Uh, yeah, today is, uh, you know, <laughs> this one's near and dear to my heart because I feel like I, I'm literally living a similar situation. Uh, this is coming out of MJ Biz Daily. Once high-flying flow cannabis co. falls to earth amid woes, offering lessons for others. And definitely, I suggest that everybody go read this full article because there are definitely lessons learned here about things not to do and things we might be able to do in the compliant industry. So Flow Cannabis Co., also known as Flow Connor, which was launched in 2015, was an early and vocal advocate for small growers in Humboldt, Mendo, and Trinity counties, really being that large aggregator of sun-grown cannabis. You know, the company bought a large Northern California wine estate in 2017. The goal was to transform the historic property into a cannabis institute catering to small batch cannabis growers. Um, Flocana, you know, essentially started driving this. You know, they really wanted this to go. Michael Simons, a co-founder and CEO and current chief uh, servant officer of Flow Cannabis, Flow Kana, previously likened the company to household brands such as Sunkiss, Uber, and Whole Foods, which enlist a model where centralized entity aggregates and sharing the profit. So again, this was to empower small farmers to have a place where they could bring their their their, their crop, and then Flow Kana would either repackage it for their brand or sell it to others. And that I think was going well, but of course, what are the lessons to be learned? Well, one, you know overly ambitious and ill-advised assumptions, meaning we thought deschedule or bust. We thought Uncle Sam would legalize earlier, and that, of course, did not happen, right? Um, Steinmetz, who's, you know, so passionate about understanding this broken regulatory system, has um, joined the California Cannabis uh, Industry Association in an effort to try to stop these things. And uh, I believe today and uh, on the 13th, they had a rally in Sacramento trying to get these taxes um, dealt with so that maybe the traditional or the compliant market can actually um, work. So, of course, between not being able to pay their farmers, not getting paid by dispensaries and such, Flocon continued to get into more and more and more issues. They lost some favor with their local community because, unfortunately, it was found that one of their employees um, was responsible for a fire in Mendo, a pretty big one. Um, there's not much details in this article and I don't know much about it, but like that's, you know, 
community relations are key. It's also cited in the article that the biggest value or, or equity value in the Emerald Triangle is relationships and trust, right? That is still a big thing. And so, of course, pissing off your neighbors by having one of your employees start a fire doesn't go well to that. But Flow Cannabis kids future, just like all our futures, is up in the air, right? They are still struggling to figure out how do we stay compliant? How can we sell cannabis with all these taxes being overgrown and all this just mess that we're talking about or all these articles lead back to the fact that somehow we got put into a position where we have a marketplace that should be thriving, but we're still being held back from taxes and just crazy regulations. And if you're at the flower level, it's even more pronounced, right? Flow Cannabis at one point had 800 points of sale in the market to 5,000 dispensaries during the heyday of medical prop 215. Right now, they're looking at 300 and only 150 pay them on time, right? That's something that all cannabis companies are doing. Our supply chain is so broken that it doesn't matter if you try to resize your company because your A&R might not work because your front people are not paying you, right? You then have supply chain issues on the back end because folks might be going out of business because nobody's paying them, right? So we definitely have a huge issue here in California, which I think has been highlighted by many of these other um uh, other uh, other articles that we've been hearing over the last couple of days. So, you know, again, I, I, I encourage everybody to read. I'm not doing this fairly lengthy, in-depth article justice. I'm not going to go into some of the board and financial stuff because, candidly, I'm literally in the same situation with similar people and don't want to uh, allow myself to say too much. Suffice it to say, we took capital early. We thought we were getting a real industry. We tried to play like the big boys, and I think they're screwing us. That's my opinion personally. I think that if you look at the Flo Kana model, it's that classic example of here's some money. Go ahead, do it. But port you at the legislative level. Our big dollars from these bigger investors are not going to go to Sacramento to put pressure on them. In fact, we're just going to wait till you bleed out. And then we're just going to aggregate you into the usual suspects of Bank of America and JP Morgan owned companies. And I, 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 I'm just look, you guys, this is awful. And it's as nefarious as it sounds. We all need to get our heads back in the game and figure out how we can start to push back against these kinds of things. Because Flocana is not the first, and they certainly won't be the last company that has at least some cultural heart that's getting squeezed out. Not because they're bad business operators, but because the environment is not geared towards successful growth of cannabis companies. Gee, I'll leave it there for our thoughts. Yeah. I'm real court reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Thank you, Gee. Um, we, we're at time at this, but a lot of people uh, want to weigh in. I want to talk about the, the fire, which was a lawnmower, but I don't have time for that. I want to talk about the freeway, the community outreach, the freeway, adopt a freeway thing, but I don't have time for that. Uh, and I want to talk about the taxes, but I don't have time for that. But I do want to talk about Prop 64 and the lie that was sold to the farmers because the farmers didn't support Prop 19. So they were lied to. They were told that there was going to be a one acre cap and that was bullshit from the beginning. But I want to turn it over to Eric and then Chemo and then we're probably going to need to move on. Hey, thank you, Susan. And Guy, thank you so much for bringing this up. And I've interviewed Mikey multiple times. I know the company well. I was so excited about what they were doing. But one thing that is missing from what you talked about is there was a serious break in trust, what Mikey did with the farmers. And I'm not going to get too deep into that because a lot of this was on NDA from the farmers. But he undercut his people, and there was some serious repercussions. He lost every rock star grower he had because of what some, some practices they were doing. So there's more to this story than just, of course, the oppressive taxes. That's a huge part of it. Well, the story says that they came back, that 20 out of 23 came back. I, the top... We all know who the top growers are. They left and they're still going. Okay, good to know. Um, yeah, good to know. Thank you. Chemo. Yeah, I just wanted to say quickly that uh, Karma's a motherfucker. Uh, Flo Canna came on to the scene and uh, was operating with what I believe is very predatory uh, business practices. And a lot of uh, sun-grown farmers were looking to them for as a, a distribution uh, outlet for them. And they failed many, many people. So fuck Flo Canna. You got what you got coming. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Thomas was jumping up and down, raising his hand, so we're going to give you the last one, Well, Thomas. you know, I really would love to pass it. I invited the writer of the article to come in. Her name is Jackie Bryant, and she's down below um, in case there's anyone who wants to ask her a direct question. I've seen this story brewing for quite some time. 
the fire is fascinating, but really it's that relationship thing. And that was really, really muddled. And obviously that puts a real dent in what they were really trying to accomplish. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us on stage. Definitely any insight or anything that you think that we need to make sure that we uh, don't miss on this article, on this headline. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Sorry, I haven't used Clubhouse in a long time. So I just want to make sure everyone can hear me, right? Cool. So, um, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for, thanks for caring. Basically that's, that's the the most important thing, right? That's why we do this. But, um, I only just popped in, so I I haven't heard any of this discussion, but I do want to clear something up. 20 farmers technically are currently contracted with the company. Please keep in mind that that is based on what they have told me. We have no real way of independently verifying that unless we get documents or somebody decides to go on record apart from that. But what I do want to make clear is that 20 farmers technically are contracted with them right now. They were not the original farmers. Um, like maybe a couple of them have sold to them since they left in in, in some way. But um, in no way was it 20 of 23 came back. It is just that there are 20 in the mix now that um, the original farmers are not included. So I want to make that really clear. Um, I don't so know then- if anybody has any questions. They might have tried to hustle some new people is what it sounds like. There are definitely newer people involved. Um, I can't say, you know, I will not say whether or not I consider it a hustle or not, but um, there are new farmers in the mix. But I also want to remind everybody that, like, there isn't the world's biggest market for sun-grown flour right now, as we know. And so, truthfully, as one of the largest and only buyers in bulk of sun-grown flour, even if farmers have problems with the company, they don't even necessarily have anyone else to sell to. So in quiet or in private, they made. There's plenty of other people. So it just, pl- uh, trust me, I agree. I'm just letting you know that if if some farmers have decided to go back, it's not necessarily because they love the company. It's because they may have felt that they had nowhere else to go. Yeah, no, thank you for the color on, on the farmers. And, you know, I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that aggregators, it's always a hard model. We started our own procurement department and I've candidly had to call farmers and try to put some payment plans. I owed money. And because I'm not even collecting from dispensaries, I've had to call them and had those hard, hard conversations. I think it's hard to really know unless you're doing it. It's just, those are all difficult conversations. Nobody wants to stiff anybody, but like, if we're not getting paid, how do we pay when we're in the middle like that? So I I am sympathetic to that, but I think we should also just focus on the fact that that's part of it, you know, not being the best business operator, but even if you are the best business operator, there's an environment here in California that's not sustainable for us to actually win. And I think that's the true root of this issue. Very true. And, mm. and and I do think for a lot of the farmers um, in this specific scenario, based on their interviews with me, and, and I have to say, I, I have I have at least 15 hours of interviews on tape with, with close to 20 farmers, um, you know, from over the years. So this was extensively, extensively reported and, and, and documented. But um, I do think, like, it just makes sense to mention that. Oh, sorry. Hold on one sec. Let me turn this phone call off. Um, sorry, I lost the thread there, but, um, it, it, yeah, like the, l- l- there's, there's a lot of gray areas here. I do think it's important that the farmers to this day still feel particularly aggrieved. I think because a lot of the relationships had turned very personal and there was a lot of, um, you know, personal appeals from management to the farmers to get your friends involved, get your community involved. Hey, we'll come, you know, the, 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 they hung out. It was social. Um, the relationships became very personal. And I think that extra layer provided a, 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 an environment for a really big breakdown once that contract dispute came into relief because people felt that this had become personal and that the the personal was brought into the business led by management and that they had a responsibility to kind of honor that. Whereas management was like, well, this is business and it is what it is. So I think that's really where the discrepancy is. It's not so much that the price changed and they were forced to reckon that it's that they felt that they were discarded and that over and over was kind of like the main theme in, in the interviews that I conducted. Ultimately, California needs to repeal the cultivation tax if we want these cultivators to be able and farmers to be able yeah. to succeed. And we need to open up interstate trade and pass the state's reform act and everyone needs to get on board. One hundred percent. We need to get that sun grown cannabis out to these states that are having just ridiculous carbon, you know, carbon footprints while still growing booths. So, yeah, one hundred percent on that. And yeah, I, 100, so sad what's happening. 
100% Guy. California is the number one brand in cannabis in the entire globe, and the whole world wants California cannabis. So let's give it to them. If I could just add really quickly to what Jackie was saying, that she's so right. It's the one word these farmers will tell you over and over from Flo Khan and some others is betrayal. They, they, they created this sense of trust. They could trust them, and then they, they really feel betrayed. That's, that's the bottom word. Yeah, that's true. Look, line. we work with over like 50 small farms, some of them really small, and I'm calling people personally saying, hey, if I delay this payment, does that mean you may, may, may miss a mortgage payment? And so it is about betrayal, and just like your friends, it's like if I don't have it, the least I can do is call you and tell you I don't have it, understand what your situation is. And like, yeah, my days now are spent calling people, trying to manage my money and the money I owe them in a respectful way so that it doesn't become awful because I just got to be honest and transparent. And I don't know about the flow kind of situation. That's how I'm handling it. And there's probably a lot of other manufacturers that have purchased flour over last full term and have, you know, chits do and either have AR issues or their business are failing. And then, yeah, then they have an excise tax bill. Who gets the money first? You know? Yeah. It's really crazy out here, you guys. But, you know, honesty and transparency with your partners is the only way we get through this as a community. Totally. And I think that's what was missing in this case, because I do know that a lot of those farmers have left that are working with different distributors now aren't exactly being paid out on those contracts either for exactly the reasons you just described but they're less pissed. And I think that that, again, just speaks to everything that, that we've been talking about it. I'm going to I'm gonna change the conversation a little bit. Uh, we're going to switch over to the bud rather than the farmer. So my headline is, uh, Bill to Limit THC in Pot Sold at Dispensaries Draws Swift black Backlash. It's Almost Impossible. From the Chicago Sun-Times by Tom Shuba. The measure introduced Friday by State Representative Mark Batinick would cap the amount of THC in cannabis flowers at 10% and set a 15% limit for concentrates and infused products. Leave it to a lawmaker to think they can tell a plant what to do, right? And that's what State Representative Mark Mark Batonik, a Republican from Plainfield, Illinois, is trying to do. While Batonik said the bill was merely filed, quote, more from a discussion standpoint, unquote, and, quote, isn't necessarily going to move, unquote, he noted it's already led to some, quote, nasty emails, unquote, from critics. Ooh, please share the emails. The discussion was instigated by the Illinois State Medical Society, who more than likely contributed to the nearly $1 million he raised in 2020 to run as a four-time incumbent, by the way. He said that he introduced the bill because the Illinois State Medical Society had concerns about potency and the skyrocketing number of cannabis-related calls received by the Illinois Poison Center. Those calls jumped from 487 in 2019 to 743 in 2020 when cannabis was fully legalized and then climbed to 855 last year. Many of those were related to the consumption of pot-infused edibles, the Poison Center reported. That's not even double the number uh, pre-legalization. I think we're all smart enough to know that people are more likely to admit to something when it's, uh, are less likely to admit to something when it's illegal to do said thing. Duh. All right. Pam Althoff, executive director of the Cannabis Business Association, believes that such regulation would be unprecedented and a burden on weed producers. It's almost impossible, practically, to be able to do this, she said. Who believes lawmakers should instead be focused on regulating alternative hemp-derived cannabinoids like Delta-8 and THCO that don't face the same stringent testing and oversight as legal weed products. What do y'all think? When somebody goes to the Poison Control Center for cannabis, they call the newspaper. When someone goes for alcohol or opioids, they call the coroner. Yes. Thank you for that, Christopher. We are at time, so we're going to end the show. I'm sorry. I'd love to hear what you have to say, Dr. Felicia. Uh, But that was a really great show. If you missed any of it, make sure you catch the replay or find us anywhere you get your podcasts or on our YouTube channel. A big thank you to all of the correspondents that comb through all of the headlines each day to bring us what we need to know. Big thank you to Nicole and Rico for co-producing the show and our pinup girl, Liz Rogan. Thank you, audience, for being our eyes and ears when there's news in your city, county, state, or country. Your addition to our show makes the State of Cannabis News Hour news you can trust.
You've been tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where we collectively move policy forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. Start your morning on a high note and join us every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time for the State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. Say goodbye, Rico. Bye bye. Dun, 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 dun.